Welcome back, all you wall-crawling webheads, to the mediocre Spider-Mat, the radical retro radioactive review show that's of a subpar quality. A little while ago, I took a look at all the Spider-Man games that were not fit for this world, sadly banished to the dark realm of the cancellacious dimension. So with that content already exhausted, why don't we swing by the Spidey games that did release, but maybe shouldn't have. These are the bizarre, the neglected, and the misbegotten, titles that were never asked to be created, but still have to contend with a certain level of derision and mockery. So let's continue that tradition by pointing and laughing at them. First up is the Amiga, which had no shortage of superhero games that a sizable percentage of you never heard of. Furthermore, Informed believes The Mule a long time Spidey was well represented here with the simply titled Amazing Spider-Man, which swung into Radio Shacks in 1990 and was published by Paragon and Empire Software and developed by Oxford Digital Enterprises. And everything I just said was so British, I could just cry into a plate of bangers and mash. Obviously, uh, visually it is, it is what it is. A standard looking PC game of the day, but of course your eye is drawn to the image of Peter Man on the right, which takes up about 20% of the screen real estate that, uh, oh my, oh my null, no, just, uh, wow. I've joked about this health meter before in previous videos, but it elicits awe from me every single time. And it at least fits into the game's wacky theme, which also subscribes to the Super Mario form of storytelling. A nefarious villain, in this case Captain Crystal Ball, has absconded with Spider-Man's wife Mary Jane, so it's up to Peter Parker to get her back. To do such, Man-Spider will need to traverse a variety of movie sets by- uh, wait, 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 uh, how does Mysterio know that MJ and Spider-Man are an item. He, he just casually knows his secret identity? Well, it's glossed over, but I sure hope someone was fired for that blunder. Anyway, the gameplay is weird in that it really feels like it started as something else and then became a spider thing later on, which isn't entirely off the mark. When Oxford Enterprises was initially designing it, they planned for a straightforward action beat-em-up thing, but midway through they suddenly twisted in mid-air development and turned it into a plodding platformer where you mainly flip switches, avoid enemies, and move very, very slowly. Wait, why is this even called Spider-Man? It should be called Spider-Toddler, because that's what it feels like you're controlling. His proportions are so odd and lumpy, and his forward stride looks like he's stomping over to Spider-Mom so she can change his diaper. Doesn't really exude bravery and heroism, does it? In fact, you don't do much superheroing at all in this. You never fight any enemies until you come to a final room where Mysterio just falls to his death. Stupid fishpole motherfucker. Oh yeah, and you need to buckle the hell up for the game's ending, as it's an absolute milestone in video game history. Ah, even Stan would have failed to write something half as satisfying. Keeping with the Amiga, we have The Amazing Spider-Man and Captain America in Doctor Doom's Revenge. I only just found out this existed a few weeks back, and while there's even less to say about it than the last game, it's somehow even weirder. You control either Cap or Spidey in single-screen fights against a cadre of villains, with 80% of them being the bottom rung of the villain hierarchy. We have guys like Boomerang, M M Machete, Zarin, Eduardo Lobo, Rattan, Oddball, is he even from Marvel? Oh crap he is. And finally, the big green baddie we all fear and respect, the Hulk. Yeah, you randomly fight the Hulkster, who I guess turned heel in this? That's exciting. I oh wait, no, it's just Quentin, guys, never mind. In terms of gameplay, it could charitably be described as glacial and choppy and oh so late 80s personal computer. When you're not blindly swatting at a jobber villain, you're doing these weird proto endless runner stages or superhero challenges, as the game likes to call them, where you awkwardly avoid hazards. Then, in less than 30 minutes, you punch out Victor, and George Bush Sr. congratulates you on liberating Latveria. 
Uh, let's move on. Punisher on the Game Boy. Yes, there was a Punisher game on the Game Boy. Uh, sorry, I mean the Punisher, the ultimate payback. I know this is technically cheating as it's not a dedicated Spider title, but fuck you. He's on the box art and he even has his name on a big yellow sticker, so that's good enough for me. Basically, it's a portable version slash sequel to the NES Punisher game, which I played way too much of as a kid, which adopts a shooting gallery style style a la Operation Wolf. Ultimate Payback has a new story and levels, and in the starting one, Spidey tells Frank that drug gangs are terrorizing local mall shoppers and then encourages him to kill said drug gangs. The only part of the game where the wall crawler actively participates is when he swoops down to save civilians after Frank has pumped lead into their captors. With each level completed, the game breaks down Frank's body count, with Spider-Man even congratulating him by saying, "Great." Great job, Punisher! Remember kids, a strong, positive support system is integral to one's mental health. At some point, Spidey's distaste of bloody violence sets in, so he's like, oh, hey, uh, Pun Pun, if, if you're gonna continue your war on crime outside of New York, sorry, I, I, I gotta bounce, you, 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 good luck! And he doesn't appear again beyond that. If you thought Spider-Man and X-Men in Arcade's Revenge was the most unnecessary and weird Marvel video game team up, well, you're wrong because it's ultimate payback. This tangled web is only going to get stickier from here on out because we now have to steel ourselves against the depravity of the Mattel Hyperscan and its exclusive Spider-Man game, uh, Spider-Man. Now, despite it clearly being based on the events of Spider-Man 3, they didn't name it as such for reasons we're going to get into. If you haven't seen the AVGN episode on the Hyperscan, let me catch you up. It was a barely functioning hunk of garbage with a library made up almost exclusively of licensed titles that would have made early Java-based cell phone gaming blush. Oh, and you also had to regularly stop playing the games to clumsily scan cards to give your characters power-ups, weapons, and other stuff I don't care enough about to list. Now, possibly because the hyperscan was already on its last wobbly legs, Spider-Man was a Toys R Us exclusive, and it barely uses the card gimmick, and in fact is one of the few hyperscan games that almost actively ignores it save for a few optional buffs. Oh yeah, call me Daddy Long Legs, baby. Honestly, it barely feels like a game, but rather a series of scenarios or scenes you pick out from a hub menu that looks straight out of Batman Forever on the Super Nintendo. This is also where you realize this is based on all the Sam Raimi movies and not just the third. There's a battle against the Green Goblin, you gotta save MJ, save Gwen, punch Venom, but all of them pale in comparison to pizza delivery. Peter Parker picks up the pies while wearing his best purple tracksuit, and behind a parked van he dies, and then suddenly the webbed wonder appears. He then delivers the cheesy delights to people waving outside their windows who live literally 10 feet away from Mr. Aziz's parlor. Yep, this is what this gameplay looks like. Okay, that's long enough. Play the fucking theme. Aside from that, it's exactly what you'd expect from a game on the hyperscan. Shallow, repetitive, and barely worth existing. It does, however, give Spidey's video game history an additional mm, texture, a much needed low in a series with far too many highs. This helps balance things out, I guess. So let's continue that low point with Spider-Man 2 for the end goddamn gauge. Ha <laughs> jeez, it seems like you can't talk about this awful handheld before Grunkle Derek. Aha! Hey young Derek! It's me, Derek. All right, here we go. Spider-Man 2 for the N-Gage, released in 2004. Uh, no, get, get Wait, out no, of here. No, N-Gage. No, Matt. No. <sighs> Anyway, Spider-Man 2 is about what you'd expect on an underpowered cell phone circa 2004. It has ugly rendered sprites, a half dozen by the numbers boss battles against the likes of Rhino, Shocker, Lizard, and Science Squid, but all through the magical lens of a vertical screen, giving you very little time to react to anything that's directly in front or behind you. Thanks, Nokia! Many of the levels at least have a sense of verticality, so the general exploration of them works well enough, but things like attacking or avoiding damage remains a pain in the spider ass. I will say the 3D web swinging sequences are 
pretty neat. Sure, they run at five frames per second and you can barely tell what you're doing, but an attempt was at least made here. Wait, wait, did I almost give half a compliment to an N-Gage game? Ha <laughs> ha One of us! Me! One of me! No! Come on, Matt, let me back in. It's cold out here. Ugh, we need a palate cleanser after that. Oh, I know! How about Spider-Man the Sinister Six for DOS and Windows 3.1? I messed around with this one a few years back, but it always bears repeating that I hate it. The idea of a point-and-click adventure game featuring the wall crawler absolutely works, but this does not, as it's simply too awkward, low-budget, and obtuse for its own good. If a Spidey comic book writer had come on board to contribute to the story and script, and if they had gone with sprites instead of this weird and poorly aged, uh, whatever this art style is, it could have been something interesting, but instead is something for YouTubers to point and laugh at. Mustard, peanut butter, milk, milk. Peanut butter. And how could we not? Keeping with the PC theme, we gotta therefore take a cheap shot at Spider-Man 2 for the PC. For whatever reason, after the identical versions of Spider-Man 1 released across all platforms, Activision decided that fans that played games on their personal computers would enjoy something different. Maybe the first Spider-Man movie game didn't sell well on PC, but who am I to try and fathom Activision insanity? They decided that a game which mostly played itself would be more appealing, so that meant minimal combat, no upgrades, and swinging from set swing points, which really took the spider out of Spider-Man. It's always a possibility that I'll examine this game in more excruciating detail in the future, so I won't go too much deeper, but I do have to point out that this version offers the only video game appearance of the Puma, and for that I have to give it, well, not, 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 not credit, but I, uh, let's wrap up with what might be, in my humble opinion, the weirdest Spidey title in existence. This is Sega's Spider-Man the Video Game for the arcades. Now, I know what you're thinking. I I've heard of this. It's just a beat-em-up. Well, yes and no. On the surface, it appears quite ordinary, but as you peel back each layer of gooey webbing, you're gonna find yourself saying, oh, wait, what? Uh, huh? First off, this never saw a port to home consoles which is weird in itself as Spider-Man vs. the Kingpin was a big sales success. Secondly, you control not just Spider-Man, but a whole host of other heroes that you can team up with, with the majority of them being, uh, wrong. Look, I mean, by 1991, how many times had Spidey teamed up with Namor or Hawkeye in the comics? You know, enough to be included as playable pals. Felicia's here, and that makes sense, but why not Human Torch, Luke Cage, or Daredevil? Hey, get a fucking Ice Boy and Fire Lady. They're his amazing friends for Pete's sake. It's just such an awkward team configuration. The plot's weird too, with a bunch of Spidey's arch nemeses hot potatoing a MacGuffin called the Sorcerer's Stone, which is being delivered to the Kingpin, but then finally falls into the metal hands of Doctor Doom again. Why is Doom always jobbing to Spidey? I, I know they might have had a scrap or two in the comics, but they've never ever fought in media outside of that. Hey! Oh, right. Even though the final stage takes place in Doom's castle after exploding the dictator, Venom reappears for one more fight for some reason, and there's like four or five of him? He also sounds like he uses a TikTok voice filter. It's so fucking bonkers. For the most part, it does play like your typical early 90s brawler, but there's two quirks to the gameplay. One, your health is displayed numerically and it's constantly decreasing for some unexplained reason. And two, every few minutes the camera pulls back to display the game for any ants that might happen to be playing. You then have to platform and shoot enemies with webbing, grappling hooks, arrows, or Namor's famous lightning powers. Huh? Finally, we have to address the spider elephant in the room. This goddamn walk cycle. Of all the dynamic, heroic animation Spidey has had over the decades, who decided he should carry himself with the unenthused limp of a Gen X slacker sloth? Stand up straight for fuck's sake, Peter. Aunt Ben's ghost is gonna be furious if they saw how you were conducting yourself. 
Maybe this was a flop in the arcades, uh, I'm not sure, but you'd think if a Genesis port wasn't technically possible, Sega would have at least put out a version on the fucking 32X. I, d I don't know, that's insane. What was I thinking? And those are the weirdest Spidey games I've ever heard of. If you know of any more, let me know in the comments below or swing on over to my Twitter. Until then, Excelsior, dear viewers, and I'll see you next time on the Mediocre Spider-Mat.